Well, well welcome uh, uh, to this year's uh, Ohio University uh, Philosophy Forum uh, public lecture. Our speaker today is uh, John Burgess. Uh, he comes to us from uh, Princeton University, where he's with John, I think, and Woodhall, a professor of philosophy. Uh, John Burgess is uh, clearly one of the foremost philosophers of logic, philosophy, mathematics of our day. Uh, he's published well over 100 papers on all aspects of mathematical logic, philosophical logic, and the philosophy of mathematics. And I think he's the author or co author of maybe eight books. Great book on uh, Kripke, a uh, great book on Frege, called Fixing Frege, book on Theory of Truth, book on Philosophical Logic, a couple of books on logic, one with uh, uh, Boulos, right? And yeah, Boulos and Jeffrey. And then, uh, another one with Jeffrey. And I'm probably, oh, recent book on the philosophy of mathematics, structure yeah. and rigor. And I may be missing one or two others. Anyway, uh, uh, please. Oh, today you're going to be speaking about what are mathematical objects and who cares? Okay, uh, so please uh, join me in uh, making John feel welcome here at Ohio University. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for the invitation and for the flattering introduction. <clears throat> I can say a little bit more about my background. I am a native of Ohio and grew up in Cleveland. And I first learned what mathematics is in the Ross program at the summer camp for high school students in, uh, at OSU in, in Columbus. Uh, I then went off and was an undergraduate math, math major at Princeton and came back and did a master's in math at Ohio State before heading to the PhD program in logic at Berkeley. Now that's an interdepartmental program and I got to observe there the differences between the mathematical and the philosophical culture, particularly as regards talks like this one. Uh, one principal difference that's noticeable, <clears throat> which always causes problems for us logicians when we try to schedule a conference where there are going to be both mathematical and philosophical speakers, is that after a philosophy talk, there's always scheduled as much time for discussion as the length of the talk. And if that whole time isn't finished, that's a serious negative about the talk. It hasn't generated enough discussion. After a mathematical talk, you're lucky if they're actually an official five minutes on, this, on the schedule for discussion. And well, what could there be to discuss unless someone found a mistake in the proof, you know, and they started got looking at the details. So uh, it's a really bad sign if they, they start being any kind of intense discussion after a mathematical talk. The other difference is this is back in the pre-PowerPoint, pre-everything else uh, era, is when it was announced a philosopher so-and-so was going to come to read a paper, philosopher so-and-so would come and would read a paper in the most literal sense. Uh, and uh, in the, the math talks, they never come with more than you know five index cards with some notes on them and talk from the notes. There also was a, some kind of difference in expectations about accessibility of the talk. I remember being told that the rule for the math talk was if it's going to be an hour talk, you speak 20 minutes for a general mathematical office audience and 20 minutes for the specialist and 20 minutes for yourself. Okay, whereas in the philosophy talk, you're supposed to maintain a somewhat similar level throughout. So either you lose everyone in the first minute or so, or then you, you have to keep them all to the end. Uh, so I am going, my, my plan for the three-day event is today to do the talk in the old-fashioned philosophical style. At least I will have the paper in front of me. I may not actually literally read from it, but it will be there and I'll cast my eyes down it occasionally. For the other events later on, I just have notes. I don't have, uh, I don't have prepared, um, prepared things. Uh, <clears throat> so I got onto the, the, uh, the topic I'll be talking about, or but I got on to talking about the topic I'll be talking about in the way I'm going to be talking about it when I got invited a couple years ago to speak at the math fest to an audience of mathematicians about what philosophers of mathematics have been up to, you know, for the last 20, 30, 40 years, and I, preparing for that, it was brought home to me very clearly how strange the things that we've been thinking about, about the nature of mathematical objects and whether there even are such things, must seem to a working mathematician. And I suppose they really could seem equally strange to philosophers working in some different area of philosophy. So at any rate, the talk is addressed to outsiders to whom these questions may seem strange, and I'll try to explain why uh, philosophers got into talking about them despite their apparent 
despite their parents' strangeness, and what sort of things they've gone into. I'll be talking mainly about work in areas in which uh, I worked intensively from the middle 80s to about the turn of the millennium. Um, and the other two days, I'll be talking about my more recent thinking and the, and the book, uh, Rigor and Structure. So I've said I propose to address you on philosophical questions concerning the existence and nature of the objects of mathematics, the things the subject they're about. And now having said that, uh, the first thing I'm going to do afterwards is dismiss half of, math half of mathematics. I'm not going to talk about geometry. Up until 1800, that was thought to be about the physical space around us in which we live and move and have our being. And since then, it's been thought of in a quite different way. But I won't be talking about that. I'll be talking about arithmetic, algebra, and analysis. Analysis is the part of mathematics that begins with calculus. And that will provide us more than enough examples and topics. Now, of course, if you go back further in the history, as, 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 as it's often advisable to do in beginning an investigation like this, uh, you don't have to go back too many hundreds of years until there's no analysis. Okay? And then uh, go back a little further, there's no algebra either, and indeed not even much arithmetic. If you go back far enough, there is some arithmetic, not much. It doesn't have any objects. There are no distinctive objects of arithmetic. The numerals 1, 2, 3, and so forth, they're not thought of as the names of things, as names of numbers, and they don't function as nouns. They function only as adjectives, as in one sheep, two sheep, three sheep, that sort of way. Even where they appear to function as nouns, that's when you say two and two make four, what is said can easily be understood as elliptical for something in which they function only as adjectives, namely two things and two things make four things. So one sees this, for instance, in the biblical book of Numbers. Okay, well, I can't claim to be able to read this in the original, but I have looked at it in, in what are supposed to be extremely literal English translations, and I've also looked at the Septuaginta, which is the ancient Greek version of it. And uh, we do not find there phrases involving the expression the number of. The topic of the book, to the extent that there is a topic, is a census of men of military age. And the results are not expressed by saying the number of men was 600,000. The results are expressed by saying all they who were counted were 600,000. And of course, that means they were 600,000 men. And so the, the numeral is actually appearing as an adjective, though the noun isn't explicitly expressed. And it's, this is quite consistently that way. There's no, the numbers are not things in this. Contrast this with what we find in reports of Pythagorean number theory. Six is a perfect number, seven is a prime number, eight is a cubic number, nine is a square number, and so on. Here the nominal use is firmly established, and so we can say that numbers are being reified, they're being treated as things. The change seems to have occurred sometime between the era of the legendary Pythagoras and that of the historical Plato, though unfortunately just this period in the history of mathematics is very poorly documented mainly because of the success of Euclid's elements, which led to people not copying anymore the older mathematical works. Um, we do, however, know that the change did not occur without some difficulties. So William and Martha Neal, in their standard history of logic, uh, cite, for instance, a text by Pusippus, that's Plato's nephew and his successor as head of the academy, showing considerable grammatical confusion about the use of numerals as nouns. So classical Greek was a highly inflected language. Adjectives have to agree in gender with the nouns they modify, and they must be in the plural if the noun is in the plural, and so forth. And uh, Spusippus just gets in a mess about when he wants to talk about the number 10. He sometimes says the 10. He sometimes says the 10 things. He sometimes says the number of the 10 things. And uh, <clears throat> uh, a certain rupture with previous usage, even grammatical rupture, has to be involved if you're going to treat the numerals now as singular nouns and his names of things. And we see Spusippus wavering on just this point. The recognition of numbers of objects we also know it was uh, contemporaneous with a lot of numerology and it set off some metaphysical fireworks, extravagant speculations about the one and the two or the monad and the dyad. You can see that some major change in the intellectual world is taking place. You cannot see whether the change is going to be in the direction of science or more superstition from the from the way things are going at this stage. But something big happened when numbers first became, began to be thought of as objects. Now in Greek mathematics, the numbers stop with uh, 1, 2, 3. The whole number is 1, 2, 3, and so on. Or really with 2, 3, 4, because one status as a number is sort of marginal. Uh, there are no zero. There are no negatives. 
there are no rational or real numbers. Instead of rational real, or real numbers, we have talk of ratios of whole numbers and ratios of geometric magnitudes, such as lengths. And even those ratios are not spoken of completely independently of proportions. So the Pythagorean discovery is not that the square root of 2 is an irrational number. It's that a certain kind of proportion does not hold. The diagonal of the square does not stand to the side of the square as any whole number stands to any other whole number. So that's the actual form of the discovery. By contrast, when you get to Omar Khayyam, uh, who's the greatest of the medieval mathematicians, it's explicitly stated that ratios of lengths may be considered as numbers. And what this means is that they are objects on which you can perform operations, operations of addition and multiplication, like on the whole numbers. So the old Euclidean construction of the fourth proportional, so you're given A and B and C, and you want to find a D such that A is to B as C is to D, that comes to be reconstrued as taking a product of ratios. The product of the ratio of A to B times the ratio of A to C will be the ratio of this A to D, where D is the fourth proportional. Uh, so there's a reinterpretation of an old Euclidean construction now as multiplication of, of real numbers. This is the same conception of real numbers that we still find in Newton's universal arithmetic. So in the opening pages, and he describes the geometrical construction representing the product. Only Newton allows also negative numbers and says they can be interpreted geometrically by taking account of the lengths of the segments, the positive or negative ratios. Let me underscore the connection between conceiving of this or that as an object and conceiving it as something to which one can apply an operation by citing another example, the work of Cantor from which set theory arose. So the starting point here was the theorem about trigonometric series. You don't need to know what trigonometric series are, but it's what's involved in representing uh, uh, you know, the sound of an oboe as a superposition of uh, the sounds of pitchforks. Uh, pitch, pitch, what are they called? Tuning forks, tuning forks, tuning forks. You know, with tuning forks have a pure pitch, and the sound is represented by a sine wave, and the higher pitch ones, it's a higher frequency and you superimpose them and you can make even a very nasal kind of sound out of them. <clears throat> and there was a question about whether if you had such a representation of a, of a function as a sum of uh, <clears throat> sine functions, it, it would be unique or not. That's what, that's what uh, Cantor was working on. And he found a certain theorem that held if the function was well behaved at every point. We needn't say what well behaved means and, and, uh, for present purposes. Well, actually, you could allow there to be one exceptional point where it wasn't well behaved. Well, actually, you could allow any finite number, of, <coughs> finite number of exceptional points. Okay. Well, really, and this was a big discovery, you could allow infinitely many, provided they were all isolated from each other. So, provided that around each exceptional point there was a little interval during which there weren't any other exceptional points, so they're all <coughs> sort of kept separate from each other. Well, actually, you can allow one exception. You can allow one doubly exceptional point that does is a limit of exceptional points. In fact, you can allow any finite number of them. Indeed, you can allow infinitely many of them, provided they're all isolated from each other. Well, really, they don't all have to be isolated from each other. You can allow a triply uh, exceptional point. You know, if there's only one, well, it could be finitely many. Well, it could be infinitely many if they're all. You know, well, if you can, this theorem, uh, this series of theorems. Uh, carries on like this, eventually at some point you're going to have to join Cantor and stop thinking about the exceptional points, plural, and think about the set of exceptional points, singular. And what it means to think about the set as a single thing, a one made out of many, is that it's a thing to which you can apply operations. And the relevant operation here is discarding from a set those of its points that are isolated from all other points of the set. And so the ultimate th theorem of Cantor is that his, his result holds Provided, if you start with the except point of a set of exceptional points and keep applying this operation of throwing out the isolated points, eventually you get down to nothing. There's not the, eventually, there's nothing left. So that's where, that's where set theory came from. Uh, the, the, it's the transition from talking about points in the plural to talking about sets of points in the singular. And what it means to think of the set as a single thing is to think, it as, think of it as a thing that you apply operations to. Okay. So, as is well known, set theory was not accepted immediately or without controversy. But the tendency since the late 19th century has ultimately been towards freer and freer acceptance of more and more kinds of objects. 
And this process has gone on now for, for over a century. In describing, uh, in describing it, mathematicians will speak of uh, going on to higher and higher levels of abstraction. Okay. In philosophical usage, by contrast, the abstract concrete distinction is an all or nothing affair, and the whole numbers were already as abstract as anything gets. Uh, this minor, though it, as it turns out, crucial terminological observation brings me to the uh, subject I hinted at earlier, a kind of commu the communication, or rather failure of communication between mathematics and philosophy. So contacts between the two disciplines are never going to again be as close as they were in the days of Descartes and Leibniz when the most eminent mathematicians and the most eminent philosophers were some of the same people. Over the subsequent centuries, there has been a variation back and forth between periods of fairly close contact and periods of what seem utter remoteness. And I should emphasize that during the periods of remoteness, even those philosophers who are specializing in philosophy and mathematics don't have much directly to do with or directly to say to mathematicians during these periods of separation. And there really is or should be no mystery as to why we see this pattern. It arises from the interplay of two factors. So the first factor is just this, that philosophy of mathematics itself has two sides, so to speak. There's a part that's concerned with internal questions about how mathematics should be conducted or what the practice of mathematics should be. And there are external questions about how mathematics fits in with other intellectual endeavors, how it's connected to, uh, to other subjects, and not just to its uh, immediate, na immediate neighboring sciences, but to the larger intellectual picture as a whole. The external questions are arguably the most properly philosophical, because philosophy is especially concerned in a way that no other discipline quite is, with how our different intellectual inquiries and practical endeavors are all supposed to fit together. Um, so why don't philosophers just leave the internal questions about the practice of mathematicians to the practitioners themselves, the mathematicians? Well, that's where the second factor comes in. And it's just this, that there's been an alternation of periods when mathematicians themselves have been undecided about or divided over the proper practice of mathematics and periods where they have been more or less content. So it's when there's discontent among the mathematicians themselves that the philosophers get drawn towards internal and methodological questions. OK, so you know if you start fighting, then <laughs> it's, going to, it's going to attract a crowd. Um, and when the mathematicians are more or less satisfied with how things are going, the philosophers will retreat back to their more philosophical questions about the, about the larger picture. So the last period of intensive communication between mathematicians and philosophers ended sometime before the middle of the last century. And concern with mathematical objects among philosophers is largely a feature of the activities or the mischief that philosophers of mathematics have gotten up to since then when left to their own devices. But before discussing these developments, uh, it will be well to grant back briefly at earlier periods since the beginning of the modern, that is post-medieval or post-Renaissance era some four or five hundred years ago. The, the pattern is comparatively simple. There's generally the most contact when mathematicians are most concerned about rigor. Okay. Well, you're all familiar with the ideal of rigor. The mathematical results can be discovered in all sorts of ways, but they're just conjectures until they're given a proof. And the proof is the justification. There's discovery, but then the justification is only by proof, and only then are they theorems. Before that, they're just conjectures. During the early modern period, down to 1800 and beyond, this ideal was more honored than observed. The bulk of the creative new work, beginning with the solution of cubic equations uh, at, the, at the end of the Renaissance, using imaginary numbers, departed very considerably from this ideal. Philosophers were much concerned with mathematics during this period. The, this is the period when natural science was in the process of separating from natural philosophy because it was the oldest and most successful example of a science. But philosophers generally discussed mathematics as if it conformed to the requirements of rigor, even though those of them who were themselves mathematicians, and even indeed many who were not, certainly knew that this was very much an idealization. Uh, only part of mathematics had actually been developed on anything like a fully rigorous basis, namely Euclidean geometry. But it was just this part that was of the greatest philosophical interest because of the puzzle it seems to pose. How can pure thought, represented by rigorous logical deduction from supposedly self-evident postulates, achieve substantive knowledge about the world around us with many kinds of applications, as of course Euclidean geometry has, as mathematics seems to be doing? How is this possible?
Descartes and even to a degree Leibniz were tempted to believe that something similar could happen with physics, that its results might be mathematically deduced from self-evident principles. Descartes even speaks of deducing physics from metaphysics. The failure of Descartes' physics compared with Newton's shows that this is not the case. Okay, this is not a realistic hope. Mathematical deduction from a few basic principles certainly plays a large role, certainly plays a large role in Newtonian physics, but in choosing the principles, one has to be looking over one's shoulder at results that were established by uh, either systematic observation or controlled experiments. You have to be looking over your shoulder at Kepler's laws of planetary motion and Galileo's laws of falling bodies. The correct principles to start from your deduction are the ones that will yield those things as consequences and not the ones that seem uh, you seem to clearly and distinctly perceive are true when you're engaged in metaphysical meta meditation. So <clears throat> once this lesson was appreciated, once it was recognized that mathematics could not be taken as a model for other sciences, but must be regarded as in some way exceptional, it became even more puzzling how there could be room for any such exception, how logical deduction from self-evident postulates could play a role in any area of thought, as it still seemed to do in mathematics, even though we knew it wouldn't work in physics. This was indeed the central problem in theoretical philosophy down through the time of Kant at the end of the 18th century. It's the very first question in Kant's prolegomena is how is pure mathematics possible? Kant introduced the jargon in which philosophers have discussed the question ever since. What was puzzling about mathematics was that on the one hand, it was supposed to be a priori rather than a posteriori, meaning that it was knowledge available before or at least independently of any particular sense experiences rather than knowledge that comes after or dependently on sense experiences. On the other hand, it was supposed to be synthetic rather than analytic, meaning that it was concerned with objects outside us and not merely with our own concepts. There's no puzzle how we can know a priori that there are no married bachelors, uh, to give what's become the stock example of an analytic truth, since there's really only knowledge with the definitions of our own concepts and hence a form of self-knowledge. But how could we know a priori that the angles of a triangle sum to two right angles, say? That was supposed to be the puzzle. Kant offered a rather elaborate solution according to which geometry and arithmetic were also ultimately forms of self-knowledge. They were supposed to be knowledge of the general structure of space and time, but nonetheless, in a sense, not knowledge of the external world because the spatial and temporal arrangements of external objects were not, according to Kant, features of the external objects as they are in themselves, but only as they are perceived by us. Well, that's a hard saying, and those of you who are philosophers and have studied Kant in detail know that it only gets harder as you ask for more and more details about how this is supposed to work. Just as it was being enunciated, this, this complicated new doctrine, mathematicians were beginning to have doubts about the presupposition that we really do have a large body of synthetic a priori knowledge in mathematics. By the early 1800s, doubts had arisen among mathematicians as to whether geometry really was known a priori. Gauss and then Riemann concluded the contrary, though this view took some time to be absorbed by mathematicians, let alone philosophers. That left only arithmetic, I mean in the broad sense, including algebra and analysis too, as supposed examples of the synthetic a priori. But this too came to be doubted, not in that it was suspected that arithmetic was a posteriori. That was what was suspected about geometry, that derived somehow from very general sort of experience. But because it came to, became to be suspected that it was analytic, that its results were merely logical consequences of definitions of its concepts. This is the point of view reached by Frege around 1880. What made it possible for him to imagine that arithmetic might consist merely of logical consequences of definitions was that he had developed a much more elaborate logic than was available to Kant, who had had only Aristotle's logic and an erroneous belief that no other was possible. Well, that's the history of what philosophers were up to at a time when they were not much engaged in exchanges with mathematicians, painted in, a very, in very quick strokes with a very broad brush. Okay, and that brings us down to the, towards the end of the 19th century. Meanwhile, mathematicians were at work making the philosophers simplifying, idealizing assumption that mathematics conforms to the ideal of rigor come true. This is a part of the story with which the mathematicians are mostly uh, familiar in one form or another, but philosophers may not be. I'll just say if we ask why they did this, why they cleaned everything up, well, various factors can be cited, but perhaps the most obvious is that they were coming to deal with some very unfamiliar structures. So 
you didn't know whether you could trust the things you were inclined to believe because you were dealing with things you hadn't dealt with before. Uh, and it's not like you're dealing with the, you know, the space around you which you think you know about or the numbers which you've been familiar with of childhood and so forth. And why were they doing that? Why were they getting involved with these unfamiliar structures? Well, because they were making ever-increasing use of the extremely successful method of investigating a structure of primary interest by bringing in some auxiliary structure. So this already in the first uh, important new discovery of modern mathematics, and, and, um, the solution of the cubic equation, this is already visible. You're interested in equations about, re about real numbers, is there a solution to some third, some third degree equation? And it turns out that you have to bring in the complex numbers in order to answer this question, particularly in the case where there are three distinct real roots of the thing. You can't get at those real roots without, without going through the complex numbers. <clears throat> and the complex numbers is the first example of an auxiliary structure that was, looked strange and people didn't really know what to make of. Um, that's why the numbers were called imaginary. So this method got increasingly used and the variety of auxiliary structures being brought in vastly increased over the course of the 19th century so that it became desirable to deal with whole batches of them at once. So for example, in the theory of equations, talking about the solution to the third degree and fourth degree equation, whether we could have a similar solution to fifth degree equations, it became, uh, one, it became natural to talk about permutations of the roots of the equation, to think about permutations of the roots of the equation that there are. In geometry, um, it became a useful method to think about uh, transformations of the space like sliding everything over or turning everything around or flipping something in a reflection and what happens to different figures under these operations. This is used in a tiny way in Euclid, the method of superposition, but he's, he's ashamed of resorting to it and sort of only does it on a few occasions when he can't think what else to do. But it became a, a central thing that was done. These two different, completely different looking subjects, the permutations of roots of an equation and the geometric transformations, both came to be seen as instances of a single kind of auxiliary structure, the group. So there was a group of permutations of the roots, there was a group of rigid motions, say, of the plane, or groups of other kinds of motions of the plane. <clears throat> and improving theorems about all groups or all structures of a certain kind, you just can't rely on intuitions derived from familiarity with a few examples because you don't know whether those are going to apply to the other examples. You really have to look at what follows in a strictly logical way from the defining product, uh, properties of the kind of thing in question. And so being strict about logical deduction, being rigorous is what, what you have to do if you're going to do mathematics this way. The installation of rigor did not concern, however, only these new structures. There was also a more searching examination of the old ones, and in particular of the number systems. The imaginary numbers ceased to have an air of mystery about them when they were nearly simultaneously Gauss and two amateur mathematicians around 1800 hit on the idea of representing them as points in the plane. Uh, and then Hamilton went beyond this and said, well, why points in the plane? Why not just two real numbers, the coordinates of the points in the plane? Forget about the geometry. Um, it's characteristic of the period that Hamilton didn't just do this, represent the complex numbers as pairs of real numbers, but also ask, well, we can now we have this way of multiplying the pairs. Could we do something like that for triplets? Could we do something like that for, for fourtuples of, of numbers and so forth? And he found out, well, whether you can or can't depends on how many of the usual properties of, of uh, multiplication you want to retain. And basically, you can't do anything with three. You can do it with four, provided you... Uh, uh, provided you're willing to give up the commutative law of multiplication, um, nothing much, five, six, seven. Uh, Cayley showed you could do something for eight, but you have to give up the associative law. At any rate, the idea that you, the, the, the rigorization, cleaning up the theory of complex numbers, so it just becomes an application of the theory of real numbers, and generalization, looking at these new systems of numbers, the quaternions and the octonions, are go hand in hand. The rigorization and generalization were, were two sides of the same coin. At the same time, mathematicians came to be dissatisfied with the account of real numbers that had satisfied Newton. And in this case, it's not because it can't be made rigorous. It can be made perfectly rigorous as approach you know, geometric algebra, and that was done during the 19th century, but because they didn't want to make analysis depend on Euclidean geometry anymore. Um, of course, 
the thought that maybe the real geometry of space is non-Euclidean was in the background here. The crucial step before you can do this is isolate what are the properties, the essential properties we really need to assume about the real numbers. Okay. So the mathematician's point of view is we're not trying to preserve everything in the previous concept of real number. No one would want to preserve everything that was in Bombelli's concept of a complex number. You just, you, a lot of that you want, just want to get rid of, and you want to get something that has the right properties. So similarly with the real numbers, but you have to make a list of the properties you name. And this was finally done by Dedekind, and there's a list of properties together called forming a, a complete ordered field. And the main property is the one of the, the order relation. If you have, the, if you have a, a bunch of real numbers, but there's an upper bound, so there's no number, no number in the collection goes bigger than that bound, then there, in fact, will be at least such upper bound. <clears throat> Once you know what the target is, uh, then you see that, in fact, there's several routes to that target. You can get there in several ways by several different constructions. And this was done by Cantor and another one by Dedekind and so forth. And these constructions also can be used in other places to produce other kinds of structures, just as Hamilton didn't stop with analyzing complex numbers as pairs, but went on to create the quaternions. These constructions all took the rational numbers for granted, but the reduction of the rational numbers to the integers and the integers to the natural numbers is not very difficult, again, using kinds of constructions that have multiple other applications. So then there remained, as far as the traditional number systems were concerned, just the questions of the foundations of arithmetic in the narrow sense, the theory of the natural numbers. And it's at this point that the investigations of mathematicians like Cantor and Dedekind and then Poincaré and Brouwer and Hilbert and of philosophers like Frege and later Russell and others began to come into contact. At this point, the story becomes very complicated, involving a struggle among mathematicians, <coughs> <clears throat> frog and mouse battle, Einstein called it at one point, interchanges between mathematicians and philosophers and the emergence of a new subject, modern logic and the theory of computability from the ongoing discussions. I won't discuss any of this. <clears throat> um, I'll just skip over all of this uh, fascinating thing of the period when there was intense interaction, in fact, between mathematicians and philosophers. Given the way mathematics was developing, it was clear that if it was to be done fully rigorously, one could not be satisfied with separate rigorous developments of geometry and arithmetic and other mathematical structures. You had to have some kind of comprehensive background in which you could develop the general theory of structures and how you make new ones from old ones, and also had something like the natural numbers, an infinite system there of things to, be to begin with, to begin all these other constructions. This background theory appeared almost by accident. Uh, Frege's expanded logic, which I alluded to earlier, was in effect a kind of set theory, one that was conducted completely rigorously, but that unfortunately ref re rested on an assumption that uh, Russell proved to be inconsistent to lead to a contradiction, the assumption that every condition determines a set. Cantor had never made this inconsistent assumption, but his work fell short of being rigorous precisely because he never made explicit what assumptions he was making. He never assumed that every condition determines a set. In fact, he explicitly stated that some do not. But he never told us which do and which don't in any systematic way. So it was Zermela who set out to do this, and it turned out that the system of axioms for set theory that eventually emerged from his work just essentially tells us that we can always carry out these constructions of new structures from old uh, that mathematicians wanted to do anyhow, and that we have an infinite set to begin with. Um, that's essentially what the axioms of set theory say. Um, <clears throat> So all of mathematics could be rigorously developed in a framework of something like Zermelo's axiomization. And this project was actually partially realized by the Bourbaki group in a long series of books on the different branches of mathematics with set theory there in volume one. Mathematicians by and large acquiesced in this new form of organization, though it certainly did not start it, involve starting from principles that anyone would want to call self-evident. They acquiesced perhaps because the framework doesn't require, well, it lets you to do everything that would occur to you naturally to do. And it doesn't require you to do much bookkeeping as you go forward to make sure you're staying within bounds. <clears throat> and more generally, because it doesn't require you to think much at all about foundational questions. So from the point of view of the working mathematician, the best foundations are the ones you have to think the least about. And uh, you really don't, if you accept this out there, Kramer, you really don't ever have to think very much about it <clears throat> if you're engaged in ordinary sort of mathematics. Philosophers by this time had concluded that the answer to their questions about how mathematics can maintain its apparent independence of experience <coughs> and immunity to experimental refutation, or refutation 
could not be something that depended on the details of any particular rigorization program. So philosophers and mathematics just had less and less to say to each other and both began to develop new interests or return to older ones. Originally, philosophers had, and philosophers went back to contrasting mathematics with other disciplines. Originally, they contrasted mathematics with other sciences as regards method, a priori proof in mathematics, a posteriori observation and experiment in the case of the other sciences. Now they return to, comp to comparison and contrast with, with a focus not on the methods, but on the objects, on what the subjects are about. And it does seem that the objects of mathematics are quite unlike those of the other sciences. And this can be brought out by a simple thought experiment. So let's consider the problem of the missing mass or dark matter, okay? So the observations of what the galaxies and galactic clusters are doing out there, um, together with gravitational theory, suggest there's some massive stuff out there that we're not seeing because it doesn't emit light and doesn't seem to do, interact with us and our instruments in any other way except insofar as gravitationally it, it's involved in uh, affecting the motions, of the motions of the galaxies. One success, uh, suggestion that was uh, floated was that neutrinos, which were particles already believed in and that also were known not to interact very much, uh, but had been thought to be massless, perhaps they have some tiny mass and they're just bunches of them out there among the galaxies, and that's what's responsible for these effects. Some version of this is still involved in proposals, but it's generally, I think, agreed now that it's not enough. Uh, it's not the whole, can't be the whole story, even if it ends up being part of the story. So suppose some bright graduate student in physics comes forward and suggests, no, it's not the neutrinos that have the mass, it's the numbers that have the mass. And they are the things that are out there in these galaxies and so forth. And I give you a formula, mu of n for the mass of the n is a function of n, and something like this. Well, suppose a graduate student came to your office with a proposal like this. Well, first of all, you might suspect it wasn't really a graduate student, it was some person off the street, you know, and come in with it, but uh, like the kind we get letters from with their new systems of cosmology about every, every month or so. We get in, we get in. If, you, if you're in a philosophy department, you're always getting free copies of books, which is a solution to all the, all the problems of the nature of reality. So you think it's probably a person like that. You would not think of this as a serious proposal that ought really should be investigated. We should write a letter supporting a grant application for it. Because we have an intuitive sense that somehow, Without any philosophical sophistication, numbers just aren't the sorts of things that have masses, you know, or electrical charges, and they aren't located in in places, you know, out in, out, in the, out among the galaxies or right here at home. They just aren't the sort of thing that have sp uh, spatial locations. And of course, if they don't have spatial locations, they can't have temporal locations either, because of course, physics teaches us space and time are inseparable. Um, <clears throat> so, in fact, they don't have. Uh, temporal locations either. If you're told that there exist infinitely many primes, you don't ask how long have they existed. Did they, did they just evolve during the Cretaceous period or you know, were they around already in the Archaean era or whatever? And you don't ask, you know, well, the protons, some people think the neutrons, gonna de if you leave it a long, long time, it'll decay into a proton and something else. Is it possible that some of these prime numbers will decay, you know, after, after 100 million years or, or, or a billion years and, and become composite or something? No. You just don't, those questions just don't make any sense, okay? And we have an, we have an intuitive recognition that this is the case. Just, the kinds of questions that make sense of it just, just don't include questions of this kind. <clears throat> uh, distinctions of grammatical tense don't have significant application to purely mathematical statements. Now, the one thing that amateur philosophers of mathematics often miss is just this point, all right, that the temporal things don't have any application any more than the spatial things to the numbers. Because there's a temptation among amateur philosophers to think that if something isn't material, it must be mental. And so, convinced that, math that numbers are not material things, they think they must be mental things. You know, so they must be human ideas of some kind. But the human ideas about numbers, those do have a chronology. In fact, I began by talking about some of it. And there, actually, you can talk about, about what date did people start thinking of numbers as objects and so forth. But the numbers themselves, it doesn't make any sense to ask questions about their chronology. So the numbers can't be the same thing as the ideas about them. Okay. <clears throat> These points, I say, are, are overlooked by amateur philosophers. Every philosopher who's, any, any student of philosophy and mathematics, almost the first thing you read is Frege's critique of this kind of thinking, attributing uh, 
psychological nature to the, to the numbers, and it just isn't a tenable view. Okay, this is what philosophers mean by saying they're abstract. They don't have spatial temporal location, they don't act on us, they aren't acted upon by us or anything else. That's what, that's what makes them abstract, and all mathematical objects are abstract in this philosophical sense. Now, there has been a tendency, as old as Pythagoras, or anyhow as old as Plato, to hail this abstractness as something great and good, and to turn the grammatical negative, tense doesn't apply to number talk, into a metaphysical positive, numbers are eternal. This has unsurprisingly provoked a counter tendency to question whether there are any such things as the eternal numbers, though to deny that there are would seem to fly in the face of long established existence theorems beginning with Euclid's result on there being infinitely many primes that I already alluded to. This counter tendency is at least as old as the Middle Ages or anyhow it has a name that goes back to the Middle Ages. It's called nominalism, a variant of the label that was applied to the followers of William Ockham in the 14th century. A large part of what philosophers have gotten up to since the conversation among mathematicians and between mathematicians and philosophers over foundational questions fell silent has consisted in debating nominalism and its opposite, which nominalists have insisted in calling Platonism. The debate reveals a fundamental division among philosophers over what it is reasonable to hope might be achieved by science. Is it feasible? For a feasible goal for science to get behind all merely human representations and give us a picture of what ultimate reality is like in itself, independently of us? Or is the most we can hope for a chart by which we can navigate the world, a chart perhaps full of apparatus such as lines of latitude and longitude that don't have any physical reality but that we need to find our way around? This opposition was described over a hundred years ago by William James, who contrasted the attitudes of the pioneers of the scientific revolution. He mentions Kepler by name and clearly alludes to Galileo and Descartes and others, um, with what he claimed was the attitude of the most advanced thinkers among his contemporaries. Since his account, though a bit dated in its language, is more eloquent than anything I could produce, I'm just going to quote it now at this point. So this is what James wrote in 1909. When the first mathematical, logical, and natural uniformities, the first laws were discovered, men were so carried away by the clearness, beauty, and simplification that resulted that they believed themselves to have deciphered authentically the eternal thoughts of the Almighty. His mind also thundered and reverberated in syllogisms. He also thought in conic sections, roots and squares and ratios, and geometrized like Euclid. He made Kepler's laws for the planets to follow. He made the velocity increase proportionally to the time in falling bodies. He made the law of signs for light to, ob light to obey when refracted. He established the classes, orders, families, and genera of plants and animals and fixed the distances between them. He thought the archetypes of all things and devised their variations. And when we rediscover any one of his wondrous institutions, we seize his mind in its very literal intention. So we're doing something superhuman. When we scientists discover these laws, we are reading God's mind. But contrasting the view he's just described, uh, James now says, but as the sciences have developed farther, the notion has gained ground that most, perhaps all of our laws are only approximations. The laws themselves, moreover, have grown so numerous that there's no counting them, and so many rival formulations are proposed in all branches of science that investigators have become accustomed to the notion that no theory is absolutely a transcript of reality, but that any one of them may from some point of view be useful. Their great use is to summarize old facts and to lead to new ones. They are only a man-made language, a conceptual shorthand, as someone calls them, in which we write our reports of nature. And language, as is known, tolerate languages, as is known, tolerate much choice of expression in many dialects. So the anti-nominalist generally takes this latter point of view. Our science is the product of certain organisms, ourselves, in a certain environment, the universe, and it is the way it is, partly because that environment is the way it is, and partly because we are the way we are. Creatures like us in a universe unlike ours would produce a different science, but so might creatures unlike us in a universe like ours. Our languages tend to be noun, verb, or subject predicate in structure, and accordingly our theories will represent the world as full of objects with properties. Objects of all different kinds with properties of all different kinds, because we keep using this subject predicate form over and over and over again in different contexts, including mathematical objects with mathematical properties. They're quite different from physical objects with physical properties. 
The nominalists, by the contrast, or anyhow the more ambitious among them, would like to eliminate any contribution from us and get at how things really are. But they find the heavy mathematical apparatus of science an obstacle to this goal. Physical things, according to the nominalists, have to be recognized in science because they force themselves upon our attention. But mathematical things are posited only to help organize our description of physical things. And if we are to get a true picture of how things really are, we must get behind this apparatus. Accordingly, they have sought reformulations of scientific theories eliminating mathematical objects, which they considered would be unknowable even if they existed, since how can anything be known about supposed objects not located in space and time and not acting on us causally in any way? Various ideas have been tried in an effort to rewrite scientific theories in a way that eliminates mathematical objects. For instance, some nominalists have accepted point instances of space-time as legitimate physical entities while rejecting real numbers and functions and the like. If space-time is assumed to be flat, then every real number can be represented as a triple of, co of collinear points. It's the ratio of the interval from x to y to the interval from x to z. <clears throat> and then you can avoid talking about the real numbers by talking about the, the points. And if the only mathematical apparatus in your theory consists of real numbers, uses coordinates and values of scalar fields and components of values of vector fields and so on, then all mention of such apparatus can be avoided. To actually, if you start allowing for the curvature of time and more complicated kinds of fields, and in other words, you start bringing in 20th century and not just 19th century physics here, it becomes harder to do this. And since only philosophers have been involved in these reconstructive efforts, they in fact have not got very far beyond the simplest case. Um, some nominalists have been discouraged in taking to saying that there is in practice uh, no replacing mathematically formulated science after all, and all we can do is cross our fingers when we use it and take everything back, we say, when we use it, when we enter, when we're safely inside the philosophy seminar room, characterizing it as merely useful fiction. This has never seemed to me a very interesting position, and moreover, one can always question which are the philosopher's real, true, sincere beliefs, the ones they express every day when they're actually engaged in practical activities, or the things they only say when they go into the philosophy seminar room and renounce all the other things they, they say the rest of the time. Other nominalists less discouraged want to press on following different strategies. One wrote starts from the observation that while Newton, when speaking of real numbers, had something more or less definite in mind, the system of ratios of geometric magnitudes, since the constructions of Cantor and Dedekind, it is much less clear that one can really speak of mathematics in mathematics if such a thing as the real number system. Indeed, already in Hardy's Pure Mathematics, one of the first textbooks uh, to present the Dedekind construction to undergraduates, the presentation is immediately followed by a remark to the fact that the expression could have been done in various different ways. And um, while it must be possible to give the symbols of mathematics some easy meaning, there, there may be more than one way to do it, and it doesn't matter which one you choose. And so you don't really have to think of the, the real numbers as being any particular one of these different constructions. Um, well, I was going to make an analogy with a, a rule that you use when you study elementary logic and the natural deduction formulation. It does correspond to something that mathematicians do. You say when you've proved there is an f such that f, you know, there is an x such that fx, you can introduce a new constant and say let c be such an f and assume f of c. And anything you deduce from that that doesn't mention c, it really follows from the just from the assumptions you needed to get to there existing an x such that fx. Um, I, I won't give the mathematical example where, where this is done at length, but in fact, the mathematicians do have a way of doing this, speaking this way. Um, on Hardy's picture, the talk of the real number system is really like this. What Dedekind and Cantor prove in their different ways is that there exists a complete ordered field. And then what you say is, let R be such a field. And then you go on using the symbol R in the phrase the real number system as if when we're referring to some unique system of things, but in fact, one hasn't ever at any point said anything to distinguish the complete ordered field R from any other complete ordered field, and you're never going to say anything about R that you wouldn't say about any other complete ordered field. And so nominalists would like to exploit this picture to argue that the theorems supposedly about real numbers or other such things are really about nothing specific, but are simply generalizations about any system or structure of the right kind. But of course, these generalizations will be empty or vacuous if there aren't any structures of the right kind. And there's little reason to believe that there are physical structures of the right kind. And they, the anomalists don't want to believe in abstract mathematical structures of that kind, so they seem to be in trouble. Well, one more reinterpretation is invoked at this point. They say, well, it isn't really just a generalization about all 
structures of this kind have certain properties, it's really a statement to the effect that necessarily any structure that existed, that was of this kind, would have to have these properties. And for that to not be vacuous, you don't really need that there actually exists any such thing. You only need that it's possible that there could exist such a structure. And so what mathematics is really about is about the possibility of physical structures rather than about actual abstract structures and so forth. For the antinominalists, such constructions are hardly improvements on our ordinary mathematically formulated science. They're clumsy substitutes. But their existence does at least show that we could have done things differently. Though for us that would have been awkward, it does at least suggest that other intelligent creatures in a universe like ours whose minds work somewhat differently might even do things this way, talking about possible, possible concrete things rather than actual abstract things, without finding it awkward or clumsy. The existence of anomalous alternatives serves to illustrate something not that there's anything wrong with the way we actually do things, but to illustrate that things could have been done differently and so show something about the extent to which our science is the way it is because we are the way we are rather than because the universe is the way it is. Approached in that spirit, the anomalous conceptions really are just further somewhat eccentric instances of the familiar practice of seeking alternative mathematical formulations of the same physical concept, something that James already alluded to in the passage I read. Whether the enterprise is one that uh, mathematicians would have anything to gain from joining in with is a question I will leave to the mathematicians. Uh, my aim here certainly has not, been to, has not been to advocate any particular view on these existence questions or even to advocate thinking that the existence questions are important but merely to explain how, the, how some philosophers came to think they were important and uh, to think that it was worth looking into some of these uh, some of these constructions. Having explained that, I think I'll now stop speaking. Okay. So. What? Uh, yes. Why don't you? And um, I'm extremely hard of hearing. So anyone wants to ask a question, do speak loudly and distinctly, and I still nonetheless may ask you to repeat the question. Sure. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I'm just curious about the very last part there about what the anomalous will then say if they have uh, options for possible concrete about the possible itself. So would they have to reiterate the same strategy and say our talk about possibility is also not real in some sense. It's another construction on which we're overlaying. And then what do they have left to say about the possibilities? I'm not sure this is making sense, but... Uh, having traded abstract for possible concrete, uh, surely the most natural thing to ask the anomalous then is, well, what do you make of, are you endorsing the existence of possible concrete? Uh, in which case, they won't, uh, presumably won't. Say yeah, that. no, they, they will insist, um, and speaking much more precisely than I have in my rapid fire remarks at the end, in distinguishing, it is, it is possible that there could exist things like this from saying there exist possible things like this. So they will distinguish uh, it's, you know, there could have been a chair over here. That's not saying there is over here something that's a possible but non-actual chair or something. So they'll just insist that you never. And so they won't interpret talk about possibility in terms of possible worlds in a way that would take right. possible worlds seriously. So, but that's, that's the point that I'm trying to ask is what, what, what the way they will interpret them will be as maximally nominalist as possible, I presume. Sure, I didn't mean to imply that they were going to say that there is a possible object mm -hmm. here. Just what do they make of the truth of statements about uh, possibility? Uh, do they just say, well, it means it could have? Well, that's just another word for possibility. It's not really giving us any sort of uh, sort of informative definition of a possibility to say that. Uh, I mean, well, they, my guess is that some of them have retreated to something like uh, fictionalist accounts of possibility uh, or, or fictionalist accounts of truth true statements that involve words like could and possible. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to see. Yeah. Well, for the, for the most part, for the most part, they're just pretty insistent on uh, what's called primitivism about the monal notion. So you just you take that we understand what it means to say that such and such could have been the case. Okay, and we're not going to try to explain it in terms of anything more basic. Uh, because any explanation we come up with would very much end up looking like we were 
believing in some things that we don't want to believe in. So you do have to, one thing you have to do is you have to, you have to grant, you know, this, there's this logical notion of what could have been the case and that that's an intelligible notion. And this is sometimes said as you have to, in order to contract your ontology, you have to expand your ideology. Okay. Yes. Uh, during the uh, last couple of decades of the 19th century, it became commonplace, especially among Italian mathematicians, but also some German yeah. mathematicians, Hilbert in particular, of uh, emphasizing that what existence in mathematics ultimately comes down to is consistency. This yeah. is sort of a, the slogan of the day. Okay? And the way that you characterize some of the contemporary nominalists, right, yeah. as people who want to say, well, look, it it could possibly be this kind of structure and more of a, yeah. a physical structure, right? So I'm wondering, uh, is it that the contemporary nominalists are taking this very standard late 19th century mathematical idea and are simply adding this idea to it that the kind of possible structure that there could be is a physical structure? I mean, is that all there is to it? The late 19th century idea plus this... Uh, aversion to ab abstract ideas, so that they, they, they want to put some physical flesh on it? Ah, uh, well, let's see. Um, they begin, they're, they're addressing people who have already rejected that late 19th century view, sort of just sort of confused in some sense, <laughs> confused in some sense. So they're, 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 they're addressing people who, who are asserting the actual existence of the objects, and they want to assert you only need possible existence, and then the possible existence objects might as well be concrete and we don't have to then confront ourselves with the abstract objects. But if you look at it from a point of view, what if they wanted to explain, to go back to his question, if we wanted to explain possibility in terms of consistency, then you'd have to explain consistency in some way that isn't involving the non-existence of a deduction of a, of a contradiction because the deduction would have to be an abstract entity. It wouldn't be well, unless you wanted to say it was a, a region of space shaped like, uh, you know, or something like that. But usually they, they end up taking consistency as a, as a, as a primitive thing. So um, what, what does it add to that? Um, uh, yes, you should ask Hellman the next time you see him. Okay. Well, right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean it, it seems to me that they're, that they're trading off of this very standard 19th yeah. century idea. Adding a little, as they say, physical flesh to their particular philosophical motive, you know, their yeah. particular motive, philosophical motivation. Yes? So I'm neither a mathematician nor a philosopher of mathematics. And so my question may be a little bit you know, primitive. What difference does it make to practice in mathematics and science uh, how you answer? What difference is it? It's, well, I don't think it makes any difference. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's why I began by talking about there's the two faces of philosophy of mathematics. It, it concerns how mathematics is supposed to fit in with the other enterprises. Do we have to represent, recognize on account of mathematics the existence of this whole other kind of realm of entities that we aren't otherwise, um, that we wouldn't otherwise be talking about except for the, except for the, these apparent features of mathematics. It's not that the mathematics will be done in, in any differently. You see, if they, if they, back during the period when there was the actual contact with the mathematicians, there were actually people who weren't, wanted to interfere with mathematical practice and change things. So people don't want to be accused of doing, of doing that. Uh, so they just think to be clear-headed about what there really is, you have to not recognize these abstract objects and realize that the talk about them is, is in some way a, a, a replacement for something truer that you could say instead. So it's in order to be clear-headed. What? It's in order to be clear-headed. It's in order to be clear-headed about every, how everything fits together. You know, because you get very immersed in this practice of something, you may, you may end up um, misunderstanding its relation to, to other things, you know. Um, See, it's interesting partly because it's, you know, so it's a branch of metaphysics. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, I think, you know, if you look back historically to the first nominalists, uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, they were afraid that people would start worshiping these things if you granted that they were eternal and, uh, you know, and, and so forth. And so that had to be prevented at all costs. Uh, I don't think that can be a realistic fear today. Um, but, um, I mean, the fear today, the things that, the, the, the non-real things that would be worshipped would be something like the economy. You, you hypothesize the economy and this is thing and you must do this because it benefits the economy even if it harms 99.99% of the people who are living in this economy. The economy itself is better. That's the kind of abstraction that actually is a dangerous one. The believing that no one's going to worship the numbers. Uh, yeah. One last thing. Um, I find myself, see, I, my subfields are ethics and political philosophy. Yeah. I find myself rooting for those who would argue for the existence of abstract objects. Yeah. Yeah. Sheer physical terms, because it seems to me as though such people would uh, would also deny any you know reality, i.e., value or importance to uh, to moral ideas. Yes, it, pro it probably usually is part of a general ideology. Would be you know would. I would think about his influence in the but I, I'm certain that that every single one of the nominalist philosophers is a materialist in philosophy of mind. I, I'm quite confident. So there's something about the there's something about the mindset there, and I don't know whether they would make up some story of, of you know there's some make some tries to make room for moral things in some respect or not. For myself, being interested actually in the you know to some extent and and what do these constructions actually prove. What I say is they prove that, you know, extraterrestrials might have a science that looked very different from ours, though it was dealing with the same universe, you know, and dealing about as effectively as ours is. So it's a contribution to theoretical exobiology, I guess, the most, the most construction. Um, okay. Yes, uh, do, do you want to start? Uh, well, yeah. How should we conceive of mathematical knowledge? Okay, let's think about this. See, now, my view is that just as the tense uh, distinctions don't really have any significant application, neither do mood distinctions. So for mathematical objects, there really isn't any difference between th there could be or there is or there must be uh, if we're in a purely mathematical statement. Uh, <clears throat> so how are we supposed to know these things according to the this is the thing I don't understand. You have to give some account of how you're supposed to know these things. If you have the kind of account that when we construct these theories to deal with the world, when we deal successfully with the world using these theories, we credit ourselves with, with knowing, yeah. with knowledge. And when it fails, we, we say, oh, error again, you know. Uh, and um, if, if you could actually be worried about this nominalist issue, but how could we know about the things that don't have any contact with us, you must have some other picture of, of knowledge. But that will raise problems already with concrete physical entities. Because the concrete physical, you know, even like stars, okay, even like stars, you have to say, where's the boundary of the star, you know? A different, we, we think of the, there's a star out there and then there's a sort of atmosphere around the star or something, and we draw the boundary at a certain point between the two. But beings who saw different kinds of radiation from what we see might, for them, the conspicuous boundary might be someplace else, and they wouldn't speak of stars. They'd speak of these larger, I mean, they could speak of what we call stars, but it would be a complicated thing like them. There must be some layer of the core or the star beneath such a level or something. Um, so um, Lichtenberg said, um, usually skepticism about one thing is a result of blind faith in something else. So the skepticism about mathematical knowledge uh, tends to go with a kind of very naive view of, of physical knowledge. Uh, that's all I can say. And I will leave them to describe how they think they know these things. I have never gotten a clear story about how they think they know what's possible and what isn't. From, um, <clears throat>
Uh, all right, James said, the trail of the human spirit is, uh, is over all, you know. So this human serpent is over all. Um, every theory of ours is a theory of ours, okay. It's also a theory about the world. I mean, what's wrong with postmodernism is that it, it, it denies that the world has any influence on the content of the theory, okay? That, that's just wrong, but it's, that wouldn't, you shouldn't leap to the opposite extreme and, and, and assume that we have no influence. That's what the early modern, the sages of the early modern period, they really thought, you know, you, there's a way things really are, which for them was identify, with, identical with the way God sees things as being, that we could really achieve a vision that was, that was like that. And that's the thing that James says we can't really believe in anymore. Uh, and so we have to believe it's a construction of ours, and they're various. They may be maybe useful. James doesn't sufficiently acknowledge that. Uh, well, while it may be useful to shift back and forth between different perspectives, it's also useful to have some kind of unified picture of things. He doesn't put enough weight on that, I would say. But it's still going to be a picture of ours. It's going to have features that are there because we are the way we are, and not because the world is the way it is. And we can admit that the presence objectifying the mathematical objects is a feature that's there because of the way we are uh, and not because of the way the world is without saying there's anything wrong with what we're doing. Okay, What we want to say is that what we're doing is perfectly all right, though it isn't uniquely right. All right, If there were space aliens doing things a different way, we couldn't say they were doing something objectively wrong that we're doing objectively right. They're just doing something different. But to say that, it's just like saying, you know, in Britain, they drive on the left side of the road and not the right side of the road. And, okay, and, and so you say it's merely a convention of ours to drive on the right side of the road. That has nothing to do with saying, all right, go out and drive on whatever side of the road you please outside. No, you don't. It's not criticizing the condition, con convention to call it a convention, to recognize that it's a convention. That's, do you want to? finally engaging the internal questions or they have some new external ones that are on the horizon and the other question has to do I really love the topic of alien thought and I want to see if you would also push it to beyond mathematical objects to uh, just you know basic laws of reasoning I'm sure you're familiar with those and oh. going on saying the whole thing about the possibility of aliens thinking true contradictions and the like violating laws of logic or I mean violating what we take to be in our human laws of logic yeah. Given what you've said so far, especially you know, in relation to James, uh, do you, uh, for the second question, see that the same kinds of moves can be made by mm -hmm. philosophers of logic who are worried about the, you know, that are in, engaged in an analogous debate and then have this possibility of, well, there's, we've got, you know, logical laws that we work, but they're not unique. Aliens could think in this other way. So either question or neither or both. Yeah, well, I uh, I am inclined to agree there with the old statement of Klein that you really can't distinguish these non-logical aliens from badly translated aliens. You know, that what could what could count worse against the against the uh, uh, against the hypothesis that this means p and not p, you know, than the fact that that's absurd. Um, the truth is, if you look at these deviant logics, all the different, you know, the different kinds of deviant logics, it is not possible to carry out anything like sustained ordinary reasoning in any of them except the intuitionistic logic. That's the only alternative to the classical logic in which you can actually have. It's the only one for which there exists any large body of actually deductive materials that have carried out according to the canons of that logic. And you see this when you look at the meta theorems that are proved about these logics by the advocates of them. The advocates of intuitionistic logic adhere to intuitionistic logic when they're proving meta theorems about systems of intuitionistic logic. The, um, the adherence of all these other things just give classical proofs. Yeah, I noticed that. They, yeah, so, so I mean, that's a sign that uh, strongly suggests that they don't really believe in their own, <laughs> uh, in their own, in their own logic. Uh, 
Oh, the basic level of reason. Yeah, I haven't thought it through. Okay, I haven't thought all these issues through. No. Um, I have to admit, there are many issues I haven't thought all the way through. But, but. Yeah. You, you were talking about uh, uh, the 19th century, uh, what possible reasons there would be for this concern with race. Yeah. And so you pointed out that people started thinking about different kinds of structures than they had thought about before, each of the absence from intuition and so on and so forth. But I, I wonder if in connection with that was also the fact that mathematicians were making what appeared to be mistakes and they realized they were making mistakes, right? So for example, they had the, the, these notions, right, of, of of continuity, people thought we couldn't have the idea of a, you know, everywhere, you know, non-differentiable kind of function. They thought they could prove things. It turned out they couldn't prove things. Yeah. They made quantifier mistakes in terms of notions of convergence and uniform convergence, things like that. And they started to realize that they were making mistakes. And I wonder if, in fact, it was the knowledge that they were dealing with structures. And as you say, they weren't relying so much. On, they couldn't rely so much on intuition anymore. Yeah. And moreover. Things that they thought they were proving turned out to be not proofs at all, but genuine mistakes. Yeah, Even well, it, it's <clears throat> there's a letter from Abel somewhere in which he says, and he talks about how 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 confused all the reasoning is, you know, in, in contemporary analysis. It's, it's really surprising how few erroneous results people end up in this way. In this way, and it's just because there was some the, the people who were making the mistakes were mostly very bright people. And so they, someone like Euler can do transformations that would just make a mathematician's hair stand on end who looked at them today. Uh, you know, but he never lands at the, you know, he's inches away from com proving complete contradictions and nonsense, but he never lands there. There's something that all, there's something always guides him to the results that are, sim that are sensible and so you know that if he's done something it should be possible to reconstruct it. Now there are other people who were less talented and they did wrong things. So there are, you know, there were false theorems proved and that's right through the Italian school of, a, of algebraic geometry, right, well into the 20th century, um, you know, announced results to which then other people became famous for, <laughs> for producing counterexamples. Um, it's just that subject is particularly hard to rigorize. So there was some concern. There was some concern about about errors, but of course you can make errors even when you're being perfectly rigorous too. So there's a there's a limit to that. So what I say, the official position is that there are many 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 reasons why they, many reasons why they did this. But when we cite, it's maybe overdetermined. There were plenty of reasons why they should want to do it, but just the weight of tradition that you're supposed to do, the, the thought that you always do, and that you've always been doing these funny things with a bad conscience, uh -huh. also has plays a role. Um. So maybe uh, what we should do is thank the speaker and head back for some wine and cheese in the philosophy department. And I also wanted to tell people, although usually uh, for the philosophy forum, it's usually restricted philosophy department. So since we've been talking about all kinds of interesting topics in mathematics, including set theory, category theory, and all sorts of other things. Uh, uh, I'm very interested in to come on uh, tomorrow and uh, Saturday morning. Okay? So, why don't you thank the speaker? No, thank you.